Right, I'm going to go with this weird, creepy lighting this time. Try it out, you know. Ah, this rupture with Sheridan deprived Johnson of one of his most agreeable resources for amusement in his lonely evenings. For Sheridan's well-informed, animated, and bustling mind never suffered conversation to stagnate. And Mrs. Sheridan was a most agreeable companion to an intellectual man. She was sensible, ingenious, unassuming, yet communicative. I recollect with satisfaction many pleasing hours which I passed with her under the hospitable roof of her husband, who was to me a very kind friend. Her novel, entitled Memoirs of Miss Sidney Bidolph, contains an excellent moral, while it inc inculcates, inculcates, inculcates a future state of retribution. And what it teaches is impressed upon the mind by a series of a deep distress as can affect humanity. In the amiable and pious heroine, who goes to her grave unrelieved, but resigned, and full of hope of heaven mercy. Johnson paid her this high compliment upon it. I know not, madame, that you have a right, upon moral principles, to make your readers suffer so much. Now I will read a long footnote about this topic. <clears throat> My position has been well illustrated by Mrs. He's talking about the, um, the more, more, I guess the moral of this lady's book. My position has been very well is illustrated by Mr. Belshin of Bedford in his essay on dramatic poetry. Quote, The fashionable doctrine, says he, both of moral moralists and critics in these times is that virtue and happiness are constant concomitants, and it is regarded as a kind of dramatic piety to maintain that virtue should not be rewarded, nor vice punished in the last scene of the last act of every tragedy. This conduct in our modern poet is, however, in my opinion, extremely injudicious, for it labors in vain to in inculate a doctrine in theory which everyone knows to be false in fact viz. that virtue is real life is always productive of happiness in vice of misery. Thus Congreve concludes the tragedy of the mourning bride with the following foolish cup couplet. For blessings ever wait on virtuous deeds, and thought, and though all late, a sure reward succeeds. When a man eminently virtuous, a Brutus, a Cato, or a Socrates, finally sinks under the pressure of accumulated misfortune, we're not only led to, dis to entertain a more indignant hatred of vice than if he rose from his distress, but we are inevitably induced to cherish, cherish the sublime idea that a day of future retribution will arrive when he shall receive not merely poetical, but real and substantial justice. This is quoted from the Essays, Philosophical, Historical, and Literary, London, 1791, Volume 2, 8th Volume, page 317. Boswell goes on on this belated topic. This is well reasoned and well expressed. I wish, indeed, that the ingenious author had not thought it necessary to introduce any instance of a man eminently virtuous, as he would then have avoided mentioning such a ruffian as Brutus under that description. Mr. Belshin discovers in his essays so much reading and thinking and good composition that I regret his not having been fortunate enough to be educated a member of our excellent national establishment. Had he not been nursed in nonconformity, he probably would have not have been tainted with these heresies, as I sincerely and I in that so slight investigation think them, both in religion and politics, which, while I read, I am sure, with candor, I cannot read without offense. Anyway, back to the uh, story at hand. Mr. Thomas Davies, the actor, who then kept a bookseller's shop in Russell Street, Covent Garden, Number eight, the very place where I was fortunate enough to be introduced to the illustrious subject of this work, 
deserves to be particularly marked. I never pass it by it without feeling reverence and regret. Anyway, this man told me that Johnson was very much his friend and came frequent to his house, where he more than once invited me to meet him. But by some unlucky accident or, or other, he was pre prevented from coming to us. <clears throat> Maybe if I sit back, then I can't read. Mr. Thomas Davies was a man of good understanding and talents with the advantage of a liberal ed education. Though somewhat pompous, he was an entertaining companion, and his literary performances have no inconsiderable share of merit. He was a friendly and very hospitable man. Both he and his wife, who has been celebrated for her beauty, though, through, though upon the stage for many years, maintained a uniform decency of character, and Johnson esteemed them and lived in an easy and intimacy with them as with any family which he used to visit. Mr. Davies recollected several of Johnson's remarkable sayings and was one of the best of the many imitators of his voice and manner while relating them. He increased by my impatience more and more to see the extraordinary man whose work I highly valued and who's a conversation... Yeah, ooh, conversation? Yes, I've hit puberty. And his conversation... Uh, and whose conversation was reported to be so peculiarly excellent. At last, on Monday the 16th of May, when I was sitting in Mr. Davies's back parlor, after having drunk tea with him and Mrs. Davies, Johnson unexpectedly came into the shop... And Mr. Davies, having perceived him through the glass door in the room in which we were sitting, advancing towards us, he announced his awful approach to me, somewhat in the manner of an actor, in the part of Horatio, when he dressed Hamlet on the appearance of his father's ghost. Look, my lord, it comes. Um, footnote here. Mr. Murphy, in his essays on the life and genius of Dr. Johnson, page 106, has given an account of this meeting considerably different from mine, I am persuaded without any conscience of error. His memory, at the end of near thirty years, has undoubtedly deceived him, and he supposes himself to have been present at a scene which he has probably heard inaccurately described by others. In my note, taken on the very day in which I am confident I marked everything material that passed, no mention is made of this gentleman, and I am sure that I should not have omitted one so well known in the literary world. It may easily be imagined that this, my first interview with Dr. Johnson, with all the circumstances, made a strong impression on my mind and would be registered with peculiar attention. So anyway, Mr. Murphy wasn't there. Uh, I found that I had a very perfect idea of Johnson's figure, from the portrait of him had been painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds soon after he had published his dictionary, in the attitude of sitting in his essay chair in deep meditation, which was the first picture his friend did for him, which Sir Joshua very kindly presented to me, and from which an engraving has been made for this work. Mr. Davies mentioned my name and respectively introduced me to him. I was much agitated, and recollecting his preju prejudice against the Scotch, of which I had heard much, I said to Davies, Don't tell I wh where I came from. From Scotland, cried Davies roguishly. Mr. Johnson, said I, I do indeed come from Scotland, but I cannot help it. I am willing to flatter myself that I meant this as a light pleasantry to soothe and consolate him and that is a humiliating abasement of the expense of my country. But however that might be, this speech was somewhat unlucky, for with the quickness of wit for which he was so remarkable, he sees the expression, come from Scotland, which I use in the sense of being of that country, and as if I had said that I had come away from it, or left it, retorted, that, sir, I find, is a, what a very great many of your countrymen cannot help. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, what a meat, meat cute, huh? This stroke stunned me a good deal, and when we had sat down, I felt myself 
not a little embarrassed and apprehensive of what might it come next. He then addressed himself to Davies. What do you think of Garrick? He has refused me an order for the play for Mrs. Williams, because he knows the house will be full, and that an order would be worth three shillings. Eager to take any opening to get into conversation with him, I ventured to say, Oh, sir, I cannot think Mr. Garrick would grudge such a trifle to you. Sir, said he, with a stern look, I have known David Garrick longer than you have done, and I know no right you have to talk to me on the subject. Ooh. Perhaps I deserve this check, for it was rather presumptuous of me, an entire stranger, to express any doubt in the justice of his animadversion upon his old acquaintance and pupil. That this was a momentary sally against Garrick, there can be no doubt, for at Johnson's desire he had, some years before, given a benefit night at his theatre to this very person, by which she had got two hundred pounds. Johnson, indeed, upon all other occasions, when I was in his company, praised the very liberal charity of Garrick. I once mentioned to him, It is absurd, sir, that you attack Garrick yourself, but will suffer nobody else to do it. Johnson, smiling, Why, sir, that is true. I now felt myself much mortified and began to think that the hope which I had long indulged of obtaining his acquaintance was blasted. And in truth, had not my ardor been uncommonly strong, and my resolution uncommonly preserving, so rough as a reception might have deterred me forever from making any further attempts. Fortunately, however, I remained upon the field not wholly discomfited, and was soon rewarded by hearing some of his conversation, of which I preserved the following short minute, without marking the questions and observations by which it was produced. People, he remarked, may be taken in once who imagine that an author is greater in private life than other men. Uncommon parts require uncommon opportunities for their exertion. In barbarous society, superiority of parts is of real cons consequence. Great strength or great wisdom is of much value to an individual. But in more polished times, there are people to do everything for money. And then there are a number of other superiorities, such as those of birth and fortune and rank, that dissipate man's affection, attention and leave no extraordinary share of respect for personal and intellectual superiority. This is wisely ordered by providence to preserve some equality among mankind. Sir, this book, The Elements of Criticism, which he had taken up, is a pretty essay and deserves to be held in some estimation, though much of it is chimerical. Speaking of one, Wilkes Boswell's 1763 journal, oh, I'm sp <clears throat> speaking of one, who with more than ordinary boldness attacked public measures in the royal family, he said, here Boswell's, uh, here Johnson is talking about Wilkes. I think he is safe from the law, but he is an abusive scoundrel, and instead of applying to my Lord Chief Justice to punish him, I would send half a dozen footmen and have him well ducked. The notion of liberty amuses the people of England and helps to keep off the tedium vitae. When a butcher tells you that his heart bleeds for his country, he has, in fact, no uneasy feeling. Sheridan will not succeed at Bath with his oratory. Ridicule has gone down before him, and I doubt Derrick is his enemy. Mr. Sheridan was then reading lectures upon oratory at Bath, where Derrick was master of the ceremonies, or, as the phrase is, king. Derrick may do very well as long as he can outrun his character, but the moment his character gets up with him, it is all over. I feel like I should be wearing a powdered wig reading all this. I don't even know if there were powdered rings back then. Oh, wait, yeah, there was a scene earlier where he had some shitty wig on. They woke him up at, like, 2 p.m. Or 2 a.m.? I forget. All right. Uh, it is, however, so this is basically what was happening here is Johnson was 
going off and Basel, the fanboy or fangirl, was in the corner writing down every little thing that Johnson was saying at this at this first meeting of him. It is, however, by it just to record that some years afterwards, when I reminded him of this sarcasm, Johnson said, Well, but Derek has not got a character that he need not run away from. Uh, I've read that wrong. Well, but Derek has now got a character that he need not run away from. Yeah, sorry. I was highly pleased with the extraordinary vigor of his conversation and regretted that I was drawn away from it by an engagement at another place. I had, for a part of that evening, been left alone with him and had ventured to make an observation now and then, which he received very civilly, so that I was satisfied that though there were... There was a rough roughness in his manner. There was an, no ill nature in his disposition. Davies followed me to the door, and when I complained to him a little of the hard blows which the great man had given me, he kindly took upon him, me, him to console me by saying, Don't be uneasy. I can see he likes you very well. A few days afterwards, I called on Davies and asked him if he thought I might take the liberty of waiting on Mr. Johnson at his chambers in the temple. He said I certainly might, and that Mr. Johnson would take it as a compliment. So upon Tuesday, the 24th of May, after having been enlivened by the witty sallies of Monsieur Thornton, Wilkes, Churchill, and Lloyd, with whom I had passed the morning, I boldly repaired to Johnson. His chambers were on the first floor of number one inner temple lane, and I entered them with an impression given me by the Reverend Dr. Blair of Edinburgh, who had been introduced to him not long before and described him as having found the giant in his den. An expression which, when I came to be pretty well acquainted with Johnson, I repeated to him, and he was diverted at this picturesque account of himself. Dr. Blair had been presented to him by Dr. James Fordyce. At this place, the controversy... At this time, the controversy concerning the pieces published by Mr. James McPherson as translations of Ossian was at its height. Johnson had all along denied, denied their authenticity, and what was still more provoking to their admirers, maintained that they had no merit. The subject having been introduced by Dr. Fordyce, Dr. Blair, relying on the internal evidence of their antiquity, asked Dr. Johnson whether he thought any man of a modern age could have written such poems. Johnson replied, Yes, sir, many men, many women, and many children. Johnson at this time did not know that Dr. Blair had just published a dissertation not only defending their authenticity, but seriously ranking them with the poems of Homer and Virgil. And when he was afterwards informed of this circumstance, he expressed some displeasure at Dr. Fordyce's having suggested the topic and said, I am not sorry that they got thus much for their plan, but their pains. Sir, it was like leading one to talk of a book when the author is concealed behind the door. Anyway, he received me very courteously. But it must be confessed that his apartment and furniture and morning dress were sufficiently uncouth. His brown suit of clothes looked very rusty. He had on a little old shriveled, unpowdered wig. See, they are wearing wigs. Which was too small for his head. <laughs> his shirt neck and knees of his breeches were loose. His black worsted stockings ill drawn up. And he had a pair of unbuckled shoes by way of slippers. Sounds like a real slob. It's cool. But all these slovenly particularities were forgotten the moment that he began to talk. Some gentlemen, whom I do not re recollect, were sitting with him, and when they went away, I also rose. But he said to me, Nay, don't go. Sir, said I, I am afraid that I intrude upon you. It is benevolent to allow me to sit and hear you. He seemed pleased with this compliment, which I sincerely paid him, and answered, Sir, I am obliged to any man who visits me. I have preserved the following short minute of what passed this day. Ah, we'll go to that next time, I guess. Maybe a little suspense. Oh, it's getting real cutesy, isn't it? A real rom-com. 
or uh, what do you call it, bromance. Till next time, bye from Boswell.